Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. I'm Mark Miller, Dean here at the University of Arizona, James E. Rogers College of Law. I'm delighted to welcome all of you, both those attending here in Tucson and those who are far away. Uh, we're happy to have you as part of the series and here for this event. Tonight, when thoughtful, inclusive dialogue is so important, to strengthening our civic institutions. We're happy to host this opportunity for learning and intellectual engagement tonight with the brilliant essayist, or I, the formal title, maybe contributing opinion writer for the New York Times, uh, Margaret Rankin. The Pitt Speaker Series is an important part of our participatory democracy initiative, which is led by Tucson mayor, former mayor, and professor of practice, Jonathan Rothschild and established in part by the generosity of Arizona law alumni, Mary Greer, Nancy Kelly, and the Hari Trust. The series initially established through the generosity of our 1955 alumnus, Donald Pitt. The Pitt Family Foundation Speaker Series brings some of the nation's most prominent and influential voices in law, democracy, and public policy to our virtual campus. Tonight's program begins our third year of the Pitt Series. In addition to tonight's program with Margaret Renkel, Thomas Frank will be here in person on November 30th. In the spring, we look forward to welcoming Steve Levitsky, Annette Gordon-Reed, and Margaret Sullivan, all virtually. You can find our schedule and hear the prior talks at law.arizona.edu. And because you registered for this talk, you will automatically receive invitations to future pit talks. We hope you will be able to join us for all of these events. Now, I see the virtual podium to Jonathan Rothschild to introduce our speaker. Okay. Thank you, Dean, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, as the Dean has mentioned, we have an outstanding uh, lineup again this year. In the past, of course, we've had, among others, Eddie Gloud Jr., Ezra Klein, Lawrence Lessig, Jan Napolitano. We're really proud of what we can bring to this community. Um, and of course, having Thomas Frank live here at the end of November will be our first live presentation since we did this started in COVID. Um, the purpose of the series as it was envisioned by Mr. Pitt and by uh, the group from the foundation uh, is uh, to um, try to bring reasonable voices to our uh, public forum. And while we've had a number of social scientists, political science historians, some electeds, uh, and we've talked a lot about reform and structure and the forces that drive where we are, tonight we're gonna do a little differently. And, and I think for excellent reason, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna listen to an English major. And, uh, Margaret Rinkle was born in Andalusia, Alabama, grew up in Birmingham, went to Auburn University, uh, went north for a semester to get her PhD at Penn. She didn't like the cold, came back and uh, got her master's in a writing program for the University of South Carolina. She spent 10 years as a high school English teacher uh, and then founded an online literary magazine. Uh, she is now the author of two books, uh, Late Migrations, A Natural History of Love and Loss, and uh, Graceland at Last is her most recent book, Graceland at Last. And it's really from those essays that, uh, which are a collection from uh, her work as a weekly, writing a weekly column in the New York Times, uh, that this comes. Uh, if you've read her at all, you know why we've included her in this series. Uh, she is described as an essayist who confronts the tired, flat stereotypes of, the, of a homogenous, conservative redneck South while acknowledging the kernels of truth from which they arise. And remember, we're here in Arizona. And, and in fact, I, hopefully we'll get into that conversation of, of regionalism versus where we are as a country. Uh, Hers is one of the most current articulate voices for the case of reason, civility, and constructive progress who's writing today. A child of the South, she 
uh, works for stories that illustrate the complexities of the world we live in and does not write in black or white. So we thought we'd give everyone a, a bit of a, uh, maybe a, something to think about uh, two or three weeks out of, from the 22 election and just have a conversation with Margaret Wrinkle. Uh, what, what we plan to do is that the Dean and I will ask questions for maybe about half an hour, and then we're gonna open it up to your questions, those of you who are viewing this evening. And so please get your questions in uh, and uh, uh, we'll ask them. Uh, Margaret, uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Really a pleasure. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. Uh, uh, you've heard a little from both the Dean and I about this speaker series. So why don't we start with just a really simple question. Uh, is it possible, is it possible to engage in today's world in a political conversation with someone who you have great disagreement? Can you give us examples of that? And how do you go about doing that? Not I think that we have to maybe set out some terminology really clearly from the start, um, because I think maybe we've come to a point in our public discourse where the word civility implies something that isn't true. We think that um, civility means always seeking consensus or finding some sort of middle ground that if we don't manage those two things, if we, if we can't come to an agreement, um, then, uh, then there's no point in even attempting to be um, civil with somebody. And I think um, it helps to just, to just say that there is really no reason for attacks in a conversation. Um, we, we have had it demonstrated to us on the airwaves um, during political contests for some time now that this is how, you know, you sir are no John F. Kennedy. You know, going back for decades that insults and dis go along with disagreements in the public arena. And that isn't, that may be the case with politics. It may be that, you know, you have to take the gloves off or you don't get elected. It's maybe it's a kind of a, um, a Roman Colosseum in that context, but in our families, in our neighborhoods, in, um, you know, mom groups with our kids, um, classmates, parents, those things, it's a different context. And people don't have to, you don't have to win, I think is one of the things I would say. It, you, you can make an argument without expecting to win. And that's maybe one of the first things is that this isn't a zero sum game. That to, to foster civil discourse is simply to say that we need to be talking about these things and people don't respond to fury. If, if your goal really is to convince somebody, your goal really is to change somebody's mind, you aren't gonna do it by calling them a name. You aren't gonna do it by yelling at them. You are gonna do it by exhibiting how anger, whatever anger you feel. And so, and even if you don't say anything, if that we are, we are, um, emotionally contagious species. So somebody who's talking to you knows when you're furious, whether you say anything or not. So I think this, the, the real trick, and it's something I do better at times than other times. Some, sometimes I do it incredibly less well. I think the older I get, the better at it I get. I've been, I've been trying for a long time, but still there are people who don't speak to me, who don't want to speak to me because I represent the evil other side. But for me, the way to suppress that anger, to keep that um, uh, antipathy and disdain 
that naturally sort of bubbles up when you disagree with somebody and you think that you are right and they are wrong. And in today's world on both sides, the belief is that the other side is not just wrong, but dangerously wrong. Um, the trick is to always remember that we belong to the same species, you know, to recognize and engage the other person's humanity. So there is something you share with that person. It could be DNA. It could be a child's school. It could be the same street. But there is some point where you came together and that indicates that there are other points of connection. And if you can continue to see the humanity of that other person, you can continue to engage that other person's humanity. It might be a really long game. It might be something that, um, and I'll tell you a couple examples, but I think I've been talking too long. I'd like to hear some more of your questions, but I, I, I don't, I just think you don't give up on people. You don't say, because I disagree with you and the things that you think I believe are incredibly dangerous. Um, I'm not going to continue to have this conversation. Um, it's just, you can't change anybody's mind if you stop talking to them. So I, I, I think I heard you, I, I heard your definition of civility and importance in life and all of our interactions, right? And recognizing the humanity and colleagues, parents, people you went into. I think I heard you almost exempt politics from civility, right? Say, well, you, you may have to be uncivil. Maybe that's, so I'm, I mean, I'm wondering if, is that where we are? Is it that it's become You're that- You're talking about by politicians? By politicians in the political sphere and political debates, is it have we just decided that's that's gladiators and 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 so so civility outside the forum and we're gonna we're just gonna forgive what happens within it? Well, I don't think we can. I think two things can be true. One is it can happen and be inevitable, and two is we don't have to forgive it. But the it must. Here's the thing about politics, as far as I can see, as an English major. <laughs> but from, from what I can see, they aren't going to do what doesn't get them elected. So politicians are going to stop being uncivil in debates if we stop voting for them when they are. But there's going to always be a certain contingent of humanity that really likes the Colosseum had, you know, people who were fighting to the death in the Roman Colosseum had an audience. I mean, people have always liked that. And so I don't know that saying tisk tisk, we shouldn't allow our, our politicians to get away with that is gonna really do any good. So I didn't exactly mean to exempt them. I just meant to say, pragmatically speaking, we don't have any control over that. Um, but if we did, the control would come from an electorate who got disgusted with it. And I'm waiting for that day. That's what I can say. Praying so, for that day. So, so I mean, can it, maybe this is my naive faith, but I see, and can you see a role for civility in politics? Can you see where a candidate comes forward and says in a very articulate and reasoned way, look, I'm not going to go there. And believe me, as an elected, I remember that my campaign advisors, my media people, oh, we're going to run negative ads, okay, because negative sticks, all right, okay, but in your, can you see a role for civility in politics? I think it would be fun to find out, like, <laughs> what if somebody who is really, really well um, funded didn't need to um, didn't need to uh, necessarily obey the media advisors tried it. Um, you know, I'm not going to go negative. I'm not going to go negative. You know, often they they say that and then they change their minds when they're losing. It, 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 so it's um, this 
trend, this pattern. I mean, I think we're all sitting here, at least I am trying to think of who can I hold out as a modern example of a politician who's either tried that. I mean, lots of people say it at, this, at some point and then do something else. I, I'm wondering about the connection between your concern, our concern, I think many people's concern for civility in our everyday life, our, our view of our democratic and our political institutions and what appears to be something we're accepting as fact, which is at least for now, that sphere has become um, negative, toxic, not civil. I mean, it's hard to, and, and is it, is it possible? Do you see? I mean, you write about this, but is it, it in the end, if our politics remains so acidic, is it going to undermine or wear at what is left of those daily interactions? I mean, I've just locally, I at times could point to things that I thought that there's still a society here, a civil society, people are still decent. And then I can tell you about some of the graffiti or some of the acts where I think it, in this beautiful town we live in, what's happening? Well, I don't think that um, you're ever going to find a, a, a place, a town, um, a neighborhood, any a, a, an office where everybody is 100% civil 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that um, you see the graffiti and you think, oh, well, this is awful. We have th things have gotten really bad. And what you aren't there's no way to know is how how many people does that graffiti represent? Like how many graffiti artists are writing those things relative to the population of the community that you're talking about? And generally where we are right now, and I think it's because of social media, and where we are right now is that people are, they assume that the loudest voices are also the most numerous. And they almost never are. They aren't even close to being the most numerous. They're in a in um, a pitiful, really tiny minority. But they're screaming and they're yelling and they're waving signs and they're saying outrageous things. And they get people in my profession to pay attention to them. And then it really looks like it's a lot of people. It's a loud community. But in real conversations, people understand this instinctively. They understand that kindness and generosity and patience go a long way. So you'll see a, in, in just making the world work. And so you smile at the checkout clerk and you say, I hope you get a break soon. Or the checkout clerk smiles back and says, I'm off in 15 minutes. Uh, you know, it's just a little bit of human interaction, just a little let's acknowledge one another's humanity. And it goes such a long way. There was a study I read years and years ago, and I, and I can't remember where I read it, probably in the New Yorker, because that's where I was reading everything in those days. It's the only, if I only had the subscription for enough money to subscribe to one thing, it was going to be the New Yorker. But they, there, there was a, a study where librarians were told when they checked out books to, you know, a certain a certain number of people, they were just going to check the book out and other people, they were going to in it just briefly brush their hand when they handed in the book. And then the sociologists doing the research would ask people who came out how they felt. And the ones whose hands had just been ever so slightly brushed were happier um, across the board, happier and happier with their interaction with that experience with the librarian, with the library staff in general. And, and, and it's true all over the place. I mean, you see it in so many different contexts, but, you know, there's always going to be the one that's screaming. There's always going to be, you know, but most of the time people are, are very patient with one another. You'll see, you'll be standing in line and, you know, the post office at Christmas time, there'll be you know, 50 people in line all the way through the lobby and out the doors into the parking lot. And there's only one person who's rude to the postal staff. You know, there's just, just the one. 49 other people 
are being very calm, but all of them, their blood pressure rises, stress hormones flood their bloodstream. I think that um, one person who's angry and uncivil affects all the rest of us very profoundly. And that's why it feels like it's universal when I don't believe it is. So the, the, the settings in which we interact with people and the digital interface in particular, I mean, you brought up social media, you, you, you make this powerful point about, I, I think you've just made it, if I understand it, that humans are emotionally contagious for the better and the worse. And when people are being civil or in a setting, it's common and, 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 and then when, when someone, even in just one person steps outside, it can cause a, you know, a collective response. It doesn't make everyone mean or angry, but it can, it, it's upsetting. And it, it, yes. it, so, so in the political realm, there's the political parties, you know, cable news where they, where they've built producing emotional responses into their, their models, right? I mean, it, it, into what they're doing. Uh, but, but with social media in particular, which you mentioned, it seems like an, an incomplete but not entirely inaccurate description is it's just made for shouting. It's just made for the person to upset everyone else or to provoke. I mean, well, we there... have to be clear about how, why it's made that way, because it didn't used to be that way. You know, when you first got on Facebook, I got on Facebook because I never knew where my kid was. And he was on Facebook and he would say, oh, we're, you know, we're playing, we're, we're playing a makeup game for the rain out on Tuesday. And I'm like, I got supper on the table. Where's my kid? And so just my sister goes, one time I was cooking, my sister goes, oh, well, he's got a rain out he's making up. And I said, well, how did you know that? She said, Margaret, get on Facebook. But in those days, Facebook wasn't public. So Facebook wasn't answering to, to shareholders. And so, but now what, what Facebook does, what Twitter does, what Instagram does, what they all do is they curate, they, their algorithms drive the stuff to you that is going to mostly upset you because they make more money that way. I mean, that's the thing where the whole follow the money idea really applies is that there is a reason that we are in this mess. One of them is that people are making money off us being in that mess. And the other is that the Russians figured out their troll farms figured, they figured out that you set a troll farm on American cultural society and you don't have to send any soldiers over. You can shut us down just by making people scream at each other on Facebook and Twitter. So, you know, I don't think that any of this is unsolvable. I just think that the forces arrayed against us are pretty powerful right now. So, so, so Margaret, you know, there's an old phrase, all politics are local, and you write a lot of local about your region and about local matters. Uh, but so much of our media conversation now is national. Uh, is that, do you see that? I mean, you write for the New York Times, but is is that, part of the problem and is it one we can solve somehow? Well, one of the questions I get a lot of, I mean, I can't go to a party and without people walking up to me and saying, I have this story that I think is really great. <laughs> you should write about this. And generally it's some really great thing that they're involved in as a volunteer or they've heard about in some way. But um, a really great story doesn't, in Nashville, doesn't mean that it would be of interest to a national audience. So what I look for are subjects and stories that where Nashville is kind of a microcosm of something bigger, of either the South as a whole or of the red states, um, generally speaking, or of humanity. I mean, it could be, it, it, everybody could be interested in it. We aren't really that different from one another based on where we live. <laughs> I mean, we, we have a lot of years of evolution that telling us that we are kind of connected wh wherever we live and where people like to, the, the South is fairly distinct as a region. Um, I think in part because for so long, nobody came here. Like there was no industry here. And so it became, it was rural for a really, really long time. But you could come, you could fly into Nashville 
And if you stayed away from the honky tonks on Lower Broad, you would not know where you were. I mean, you're still gonna see Starbucks on every corner. There's not a lot of difference. The big difference now is not between the South and the Midwest or the South and the, 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 the desert Southwest or the South and the Pacific Northwest. The difference now is between the urban life, people who live in cities and people who don't live in cities, who live in small towns or who live out in the country. And um, so there is probably, you probably, people, um, you know, outside Phoenix probably have more in common with people in Tullahoma, Tennessee than with people in Nashville. I don't know if that gets at what you're saying, what you're asking. It, it does because, I mean, all you have to do is look at a, a presidential map and you see a series of blue dots in almost every state surrounded by a sea of red. And in and, and the some of the bridge now or some of the gap is between rural and urban to be certain how again how do how do you go about working to bridge that gap um i don't i don't know how to bridge that gap on a cultural level hmm. i think if we are, if we go back to the question of social media i mean i i can't I can't put my school marm, you know, cardigan back on and scold everybody into being kind to one another on Twitter. I mean, that isn't going to happen. You see hateful stuff from the left and the right. It's universal. It, that 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 platform especially encourages it. Um, but in human life, in your actual life, um, most people. I don't know if this is going to be true for very much longer. But there's always a sizable percentage of people who live in cities. I don't mean the big cities like New York or Boston, but in mid-sized cities, in Austin, in Knoxville, in uh, Charlotte, you know, in Iowa City, you, you have people who are one generation removed from the farm or two at most. And so people who are urban, who have an urban frame of reference, who are educated, or that is to say they finished high school, they may have, may have some college, they, um, they are accustomed to being around a very diverse population, they are at ease in multiple cir social circumstances, those people are related <laughs> to people outside the city. They still go home to the small town or to the country. They still go to the grandparents' house for Thanksgiving. And that's where the question has to lie, I think, is how do we talk to one another in those settings? What do we say when we stop off the interstate to pump gas to the person who's, you know, gonna let us pay for the Coke? How are we gonna talk to that person? And I, I, I think, in your experience, in my experience, and again, maybe this is a good place for some examples, you don't have to try that hard to find some commonalities. Uh, you may not, in fact, you could even, and I know you've written essays on it, you know, country music is a melting pot. Uh, you don't have to go that far and you may even be talking about issues in politics, so long as you don't mention the some of the horrible words like Democrat or Republican or some of the names, uh, where you can actually have a conversation where you can find those common areas. And if you had, I mean, I'm sure you've had that experience. Well, you know, I, I should say that both of my parents were Republicans and all three of their children voted for Democrats the second they could vote. And, and neither of us budged, but my, grandparents were Democrats in the old school pre-Johnson era. And once you formed a political ident identity, it's really hard to dislodge it. So my grandparents remained Democrats mm -hmm. after the rest of the South went over to the Republican Party. My parents were never Democrats. They were Republicans um, all along and they stayed Republicans. But my mother, late in her life, when she was 78 or 79, said to me, I want you to buy us a ticket 
to New York. We need to go to New York. We need to go to New York today. And I said, why, mom? My mother, I don't think had ever been to New York. I said, why are, why are we going to New York? And she said, because we need to go join those people in that park next to Wall Street. I said, mom, what are you talking about? And she said, we need to go in there. We need to get money, stop money from running our government. I said, you know, those are a bunch of liberals, right? And she said, I don't care who they are. I mean, when you ask people what they think on any given issue, very often they aren't aligned with their party's platform at all. And it, and it's especially true down here. I mean, you nobody wants to breathe polluted air. Nobody wants to live next to a creek that's going to end up in their bedroom the next time there's a flooding rain. Nobody wants their kids to go to a failing public school. They don't want money taken away from public schools and sent to charter schools. People don't, they want you know, to expand Medicaid, but the politicians aren't listening to them. So there's this huge disconnect. I think this is why I make a distinction between the politicians themselves and the people who vote for them, because I think that political identity is a very complex thing. But if, if you gave people, and that's why I wasn't surprised at the vote on codifying abortion rights in Kansas, because the, that's what the, the polls show in all the red states. People don't want Roe to be overturned, but they're politicians that they're still going in there and they're, and they're pulling the lever for those, those that, that are, that they've always voted for. Um, that political identity is hard to crack. And so, but it can, and I think there are very, good examples of people who've said, who uh, po politicians who've backed off really hideous um, extremist platforms because their people said enough, we're not gonna do that anymore. And one example that comes to mind is recently our governor here in Tennessee um, invited uh, Hills, the president of Hillsdale College to start, well, he asked for a hundred charter schools in Tennessee um, and, and, you know, there was this chuckle, ha, 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 that he, he could only promise us 50. The Tennessee General Assembly, he announced this at the State of the State address last winter, Tennessee General Assembly applauded wildly. Well, then the president of Hillsdale College was caught on an undercover video, um, basically bad-mouthing teachers, saying that the dumbest departments in any university are the teacher education schools, that it doesn't take any special training to be a teacher. You know, anybody can do it. And the teachers lost their minds in the state of Tennessee and they, and they let their people know about it. You don't, you don't mess with American school teachers if you wanna get elected in this country. And, and suddenly all these people you know, in the state, in the General Assembly are like backing off. They're not gonna approve charter schools from the Hillsdale curriculum anymore because they want the teachers on their side. So it's just a matter of finding a way. I still hope that there is a way to animate people, not to get them to cross over. Although I have seen people crossing the aisle when things got so egregiously hideous, but, but really to force the other side to to, to modulate or even change their positions. We had, we had a similar experience in Arizona. We had a movement called Red for Ed and it hadn't been a, the legislature hadn't increased teacher pay for, you know, God knows how many years and 50,000 uh, mainly teachers uh, marched on the state capitol uh, and, uh, you know, were out there yelling and, uh, the legislature promptly passed the largest uh, increase to teachers uh, uh, that they'd done in years and then adjourned for the session. So, you know, they, they'd had it. Uh, well, this is where local politics is national politics, I think, is that, you know, what is happening in um, the state houses is, is really setting the national agenda now. It didn't used to, but it is now because they're gerrymandering and they're sending representatives to Congress that are changing the nature of the dialogue. Um, but, and those, those elected officials at the state level, certainly at the local, at the school board level, at the, 
city council level, those voters, they are persuadable in civil dialogue. Um, and I, I know, know a bunch of people who changed the way they voted in 2020 because they weren't happy about how things went between 2016 and 2020. And I think that that can still happen. I'm not saying it will be easy. I don't wanna sound facile about this. I think it can be done though, but it won't be by yelling at anybody on Twitter. Nobody changed their mind because somebody got mad at them on Facebook. So I hear, uh, I hear a version above the family gathering at Thanksgiving and the, the gathering around kids and sports and communities, and but below the level of the, I mean, you've described a lot of what's going on in the state is potentially harmful, the signaling, the states wanting to stand out on these national issues. There are these, a lot of the issues you've mentioned, some of the issues you mentioned in passing, local school issues, environment planning, really sit in, in in, you know, in counties and in cities. And I'm wondering if, if the potential transformation, the broader spread of this sense of humanity of decency isn't, you know, we don't have to look again more locally. I mean, Jonathan was mayor here. I, I, I think it's fair to say in most smaller mid-sized cities I've seen that there, there can be very vigorous debates, but, but the language doesn't hit the dis doesn't normally hit the dismissive level or the 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 level of rejection the level of of, um, of denying humanity that you see sometimes at the state and then certainly in the federal sphere well it's harder to when these folks are your neighbors you know when they're your you know you might know uh, not know them but they might go to church with your parents or they might you know they're they're you know, they're, they're, they're people. Um, the first time I ever went, I went to a Trump rally when I first started writing weekly for the times. And, um, I got there around noon, the doors were going to open around five. Uh, this was right. This was one of the early people were sort of amazed that there were still going to be rallies. He had just been sworn in like six weeks earlier. And, but I got down there, I thought in plenty of time to talk to people, but there were people lined up way on, way on down the street. So I walked to the very first people standing in front of the auditorium doors to just say, you know, how long y'all been standing here? Well, they'd gotten there at three o'clock in the morning at three o'clock in the morning, it had been 15 degrees. Mm -hmm. And, and so we were just talking about the weather and talking about, did you get any sleep? And then I said, you know, do you mind if I turn my recorder app on on my phone? I, I'm writing a newspaper article and I would I'd love to talk to you a little bit. And um, and he said. He said, what? Well, what newspaper? And I, and I said, well, the New York Times. And he said, no, I'm not talking to the failing New York Times. And I said, well, I, he said, you won't you won't quote me right. And I said, I will. I'll, I'm going to record it. I'm going to take down your email address and your phone number. I'm going to call you and I'm going to read you the quote or I'll email it to you and it, and you can tell me if it's right or wrong. And he said, oh, I'm not saying you would lie, but, but the New York Times is full of liars, so I'm not talking to you, honey. But it was like he, he wanted me to know that he didn't really think I was going to do him wrong, but on principle, the people I worked for were awful. So I think when you do those face-to-face -face conversations, it's really hard not to go, oh, well, I believe you, but I'm not gonna, you know, sorry. So, so Mark, I wanna I want go to the, some, of, some of the questions from- Yes, exactly, uh, I was gonna do uh, the same thing. Folks. Great. Uh, and here's one, uh, and I, I don't know if it, it can be a connect the dots or not, but I, I, you know, do you have a process that you use to help engage those civil discussions uh the, you know when you go to a trump rally that you know i'm going to be conscious that this is how i'm going to approach somebody uh is there is there a, a method that we can learn from and use i don't that's the one and only Trump rally I've ever been to. <laughs> I don't say that I go in, I don't do a whole lot of on-site reporting because I write for an opinion section. I, you know, it's not that I do it some, but in the 
pandemic, I did none. And I, I think it's just, um, I think it just has to be different for everybody. I, my, my general thought is that you probably don't have a lot of luck talking with strangers. It might be better to talk with people you have a, your, a known connection with um, because, you know, we, it's a strange world we live in and people are distrustful of strangers and sometimes with really good reasons. Um, so I don't know that I would say that there's a, you know, that there's a, 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 a strategy I use. I just try to make sure they understand if I have to, when I am talking to a stranger, that they understand that I'm just, I'm not trying to catch them up on anything. I'm not trying to trick them. I'm just talking to them. So and they, the, they want to say. Yeah, one of the questions we got sort of goes to that, which is almost how do you, I mean, it's an extreme version of this, but even if it's your neighbor, if your neighbor has a, uh, a let's go Brandon sticker on or, uh, you know, very strong statements about the Second Amendment and rights and, and you know, the, if, the, if the neighbor starts with an aggressive position, it, is there a way, to be, you know, if we can only talk to people we know, there's a limit there, they are the neighbor, they're in the, and you're, and you're saying this in a way, you know, someone has said, I, I, I don't trust you in the abstract, but I, I'm not saying I don't trust you in, as a human being, Standing right. me. Is there is there a way to begin you know that or is it just if you see that kind of loud not not social media but you know physical statement or expression the t-shirt whatever don't even try. Well, no, I don't think either one of those things. I mean, if if it's a neighbor who has a let's go brand and sign in front of the house. If you know that neighbor, you know other things you have in common. And, um, and I think, you know, m good conversations generally begin with questions. I mean, one of the things that I learned really early on, um, e even really going back to high, high school newspaper staff, is that people love to be asked questions. We aren't a, a society of good listeners. Um, and and you, you, the way I know that is because when you ask someone a question, even a total stranger, they, the, the words pour out of them. They want to be invited to speak. They want to. And so when you ask, when you say, you know, I know what that means. And that seems kind of, I mean, I know what I think it means. What do you think it means? You know, just with an openness to really hearing and people can tell if you can't do it, if you're, if you're only buying your time, to be able to speak yourself, that won't work either. But it's a long, long process. It's not something that happens in a single conversation. When somebody tells you they don't believe in climate change, that that's just a, you know, that's just a liberal hoax or something. There are just less and less people who say that, but there are still a few. Mostly what you, you, you get are people who go, oh yeah, I believe that the climate's changing and I believe that we that that we have something to do with it, but I don't think it can be fixed. And I don't want to be the only one who doesn't get to have a hamburger on Friday night after the football game or whatever. And, and that's the opportunity. It's not the real extremist, let's go branded stuff. It's the, how do we talk about climate change? How do we talk about uh, criminal justice reform? How do we talk about, um, you know, fair uh, access to medicine? Um, fair and affordable access to medicine. How do we talk about the, the, these things that we know everybody cares about? And, and if you talk about those things, ultimately, it doesn't really matter whether you reach the let's go Brandon guy, because those people are the extreme. That they are, you're going to move people incrementally by talking to them about what they care about, and what you care about too. So, so uh, sort of following down that path, a question from the audience with so much at stake how does one fight in a way that can make a difference versus being the kind one who is drowned out I mean I think we sometimes get so frustrated that you know and you certainly see it in politics where they keep getting more extreme if we come to the middle they're just going to keep getting more extreme how do we go about that way of being diplomatic but not being drowned out. 
Well, I, you know, there's a difference between um, being being loud and being um, like you don't. I don't know how to put this exactly, but you can be civil and never find the middle ground. You don't have to find middle ground. You don't have to come to a place where both of you can agree. You can agree to disagree right to the very end, as long as you're doing it in a way that suggests that you think that the person on the other side of the conversation loves their country, isn't a stupid idiot, cares about many of the same things you care about, and shares your concern about the others. That that starting with that fundamental um, human place, and then care, keeping that conversation open, you might see movement. Um, and it doesn't have to be. You don't have to change fifty people's minds. You certainly don't have to change five hundred people's minds. But if you change five people's minds over the course of you know, living down the street from them or raising kids with them, you you are changing things. I think that people, you know, they want that they want something, some tidal wave. And we didn't get in this mess because of a tidal wave. We got in this mess because of incremental changes in the way our culture works. Your New York Times column very frequently stands out for its, I think, more contemplative and hopeful tone in kind of a sea of fractious and strident opinions. And I, I, I'd, I'd like to know if that is in any real sense a deliberate decision you've made. Uh, you know, did you consciously decide to be the kinder, gentler op-ed writer? <laughs> um, well, I didn't start out writing opinions. I started out writing essays. I'm an essayist. I started out being a poet and then I became an essayist. And um, and when I first started writing for the Times, before I was writing every week, I was mainly writing about birds and flowers <laughs> and families and neighborhoods. I mean, that is just what I naturally am drawn to as, a, as subjects. But um, a lot of people do ask me, how do you, I, I'm, I'm, I, I I don't understand how you maintain this optimism. And the truth is that I don't maintain optimism. I write these things as much to shore my own faith up as I do to shore anybody else's. I'm looking for reasons to believe that we, our democracy is not dying, that our um, human connections aren't um, irreparable. And when you look for those things, you find them. It's not that you make them up, it's that they're there. Um, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to, add, so as an essayist, I, so what my question isn't is do people still read, right? Or, and it certainly isn't the people <laughs> who don't read the New York Times. Like, it's more about the essay as a form. Like, what kind of thought process and engagement, do you see the essay length, right? That the essay being able to do, not that a tweet doesn't, let's leave tweets out of this, right? But that, uh, you know, a traditional editorial, a, a story, a conversation. I mean, the, I'm certainly struck as a reader of your essays. It what always seems to me to be a very, you know, you're a fantastic writer, but the, the storiness of the, uh, of your writing. And I'm, I'm sort of interested in how you think about the essay as a way to try and not just bolster your own view of the world, but get others to maybe make these small moves that you're talking about. <laughs> I guess it's because I went to Catholic school. <laughs> when, you, when you go to Catholic school, um, you get a lot of Jesus. And that's how Jesus taught. You know, he, that's what a parable is. It's a story that's, that invites a listener. Those things are inscrutable, a lot of them, but they invite a listener to, um, 
to try to sort it out themselves. I, I think, so I think that's part of it. I think also um, Percy Shelley, the great British romantic poet, English romantic, but that was before Britain. Um, he wrote uh, an essay called a, a Defense of Poetry. And he says in, in it that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. By which he meant, I think, that you don't, you can change, you can write laws, but you can't really change anything if you don't change the human heart. And I, and I believe with all my heart that the way to get, not everybody, but the way to get people to come with you is to tell them a story, is to invite them into the experience, to let them participate in it in some way. That's just my general view as a writer long before I mean, we are, you know, we are, um, we're a social species. We, we want to belong to one another. And so we want to be part of one another's stories, I think. So, do, you, do you see a close connection between your writing on the natural world and your writing on people in communities? I mean, sometimes you join them, but, but just that, is, is the writing on the natural world, a, uh, do you see yourself speaking to this, not just the same readers, but to the same set of issues when you're, because you, your essays have this span and I, you know, I, I don't mean to put them in boxes, but, 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 but the Times does, <laughs> flora, fauna, politics and culture. Yeah. No, I think, I think they definitely are. I think that, um, you know, we have as great, we are, the, the, the dangers we are facing are huge and manifold. We, we are in danger of losing our democracy. We are in danger of losing our planet. We are already losing vast, vast numbers of our species, of other species. The biodiversity loss is every bit as challenging a crisis as the climate crisis is. And, and I think that the solution to that problem is to help people understand that the other creatures and even the plants we share the planet with are not separate from us. They are also part of our community because we can't survive without them. And they aren't gonna survive if we don't help. So to me, increasingly, those are very connected I'm very, I very deliberately refer to the chipmunks in my yard as my wild neighbors. They, they are as much a part of this neighborhood as my neighbors are. So going to the destruction of democracy question and, and, and perhaps I can put these two questions together from our, 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 our audience. How do you enter into that conversation, that civil conversation with somebody when there's no agreement about basic facts, I'm gonna put these two questions together. So, and second, at least in the view of this audience member, you know, both sides really aren't equally guilty in this or uh, that one side, if you wanna call it a side or certain people are trying to tear down the fabric of the democratic structure well, there's a whole series of people who aren't. And, and, and so how do you deal with those kind of, maybe, you know, where you can't get basic facts and with those who just, they say that they're supporting democracy, but at the same time, they're trying to take away those institutions. Well, they, th that's an important distinction. You know, they, the people on both sides believe they're trying to save the country. And, you know, that's a missionary zeal. I mean, there, there are all the hundreds of people who went armed to Washington DC to save their government. And it's, it's, um, it's really hard to know what to do about the fact that there are so few shared facts. And I think argument often doesn't bridge that gap. Um, but there are things, there are some subjects, like I think probably everybody agrees 
on a more things than our, than our elections suggest. What happens is that, like I think about all the time when I, when I think, I can't believe anybody would vote for somebody who still thinks that it's okay to storm the Capitol with a gun. And then I remember that I voted for Barack Obama, even though I was as horrified by his drone war as I have ever been by anything conducted by a Republican. And so it, it's good to remind yourself that when you go into the voting booth, you're not voting for the full agenda either, no matter what side you're on. So all those people, and again, we are talking about the people with the, with the signs in the yard. We're talking about just regular people it's much more complicated than our public discourse admits. You can almost not even go on Twitter and admit <gasps> that somebody disagrees with you, has a point on another subject, because we want everything to be, we, we want it all, we want everything to be binary now. And we just are complicated people. We are not binary, none of us. So as usual, we're getting more questions than we're going to have time for. Uh, but I, I would like to ask this one last question, um, which is, you know, when you do this work, um, and uh, sometimes it, it, in, I call this work advocating for reason, okay? Uh, sometimes it's a little difficult to keep going, uh, and there's frustrations. Uh, certainly more frustration some places than others, but frustrations in a lot of places. Uh, you've written an essay called The Case Against Doing Nothing. Uh, to close this out for us this evening, give us the case. You know, one of the, one of the most discouraging things about so, the, the discourse on social media is that it doesn't matter what somebody does to make a difference, there will be a cacophony of voices saying that's not enough. So, so you volunteer to drive uh, people to the polls on election day. Well, then why aren't you picketing outside the state house for fair election laws? It doesn't matter what you do. So you plant an oak tree. How dare you think of yourself as an environmentalist if you drive a car? I mean, it, 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 it's so, there, there, I, I, you know, I sometimes wonder if these arguments are coming from the bots instead of from human beings because they know how destructive it is. But, you know, if the, so the basic argument for the case against doing nothing is that everything is too little, but all of us together are enough. So if everybody does this thing, and then this thing leads to one more thing. And then that thing leads to one more thing, whether it's in terms of living a more sustainable climate um, cognizant life, or whether it's working to preserve voting rights and democracy, or whether it's working for prison reform, or whether it's working for access to, to, to affordable um, medicine, or whatever the issue is, every little bit matters. And don't listen to the argument that says, oh, people are doing these little things and then they're, so, so they're not drinking out of straw, plastic straws when they go to a restaurant, but they're still driving their SUV. Um, you don't know if the reason they're driving the SUV <laughs> is because they have a disabled adult child that they're transporting. You don't know, you don't have to know. Just do your little bit and make your little bit a little bit more every time you can. And if we all did it, it would, we wouldn't have a problem. All right. Thank you, Margaret, for being with us this evening. Thank you for kicking off the series this year. It's a great start. Hopefully everybody that was with us took something from that, a little bit more spirit. And uh, remember for all of you, uh, Thomas Frank, uh, November 30th, live in Tucson. And in the case of Margaret Wrinkle, remember her most recent book, Graceland at Last, uh, a, a great read that'll put you in a, a good spirit uh, for going out and doing what we got to do to make it a better world. 
But Margaret, thank you very much. Really appreciate it, Dean. Margaret, thank you. Thanks, y'all. All right, take care.